So I'm uh, Mary Beth Ulrich. I'm in DNIS, the course that's being brought to you right now from that department. In seminar 10, got a few of our guys here. And I am, um, I guess I'm our local expert on civil military relations. So a little bit on my background, why I'm interested in this topic. Um, I come from a military background myself. I'm a Air Force Academy graduate. I was in the Air Force uh, 15 years active duty, was sent for my PhD uh, in political science through the Air Force, for Air Force Academy faculty. It was then when I kind of got more into it in graduate school. Um, at the academy, you heard a little bit about Huntington and this and that, but not too much. Didn't really get into it very much. Uh, it was in graduate school where I re really got more into the sort of the graduate level of literature and was sort of fascinated that there's all these civilians writing about this. Like, you know, what do they know exactly? You know, they had a certain perspective, but I thought I was maybe uniquely positioned to have come you know, as a professional officer myself, but then also getting exposed to all of this. And so I just was always sort of fascinated in sort of my take on it and someone who's kind of in the middle of it all, which I think is kind of where, you, where your position is. So you're in the middle of it all, you're at a, you know, pretty advanced stage of your career, but you're also now at a point where you're reflecting and you're getting exposed to some of this literature and theory and this and that. So I can definitely relate to that. Um, I started out in my civil mill study more comparative, which means you know studying more of how this works out in other countries. Um, specifically, uh, my doctoral dissertation was looking at the adjustment of post-communist militaries to a change in the political system, the change in the democratic uh, environment and how they adjusted. And I focused on that um, until I came here, which was uh, almost 20, 20 academic years ago in 1999. And it was not till I came here that I started focusing um, also on US civil and military relations, which is more of my topic today. I still do some of that um, comparatively. I'm interested in it in general. And if you are interested in these things in general, I am teaching elective in term two, which is a comprehensive approach. So it will look at civil and military relations comprehensively, not just from a US standpoint, and covering all kinds of types of political systems and how it plays out. Yes, and back then, back in the day, Chuck Allen took that back in what, 2000, 2001? And so, so, so still going strong. So today's focus, since we're in the National Security Policy Strategy class, is to kind of get you set up for this lesson that's coming on Friday. It's uh, the role of DOD and policymaking, but it's pretty much our civil mill lesson. So what I'm going to do today is set you up in general to get you a little bit more familiar with uh, civil military relations and especially in a policy uh, making context and especially from a, a, a US uh, standpoint. And then I'm going to share with you some of my mo more recent research that I've done just this year trying to pull uh, some of this together, and it's focused more on civil military norms, which won't be, uh, which is relevant to your class, but it's not going to be repeat what is happening in the class um, on Friday. So way back in ISS, you should have read a primer out of our strategy guide that exposed you to this idea of civil military relations. And so we'll just rehash a little bit of that. So what do we even mean? by this concept, by this term, and how do we define it? So typically, we're talking about looking at the military. There's two lenses. There's an institutional lens. There's a sociological lens. So if we're looking at the institutional lens, we're comparing the military to other institutions in society, uh, starting with other institutions in the government that may vie for influence and power, um, and then just in general. So the interaction between the armed forces of a particular state or country, the armed forces as an institution, so the military as an institution, with other uh, sectors of society of which it is a part, that's what we mean by civil military relations. So that's one definition. Welch, he was a comparative, comparativist who came up with that definition. Owens, uh, he was my counterpart at Naval War College for many years. 
uh, who focused on civil military relations there. And he's also got a pretty mainstream definition. The interactions of the people of a state, the institutions of that state, the military of that state. That actually sounds pretty close, almost Clausewitzian, um, as far as that goes. So that's another way, potentially, to think about it. These main relationships that Clausewitz laid out and how important those were to uh, determining uh, strategic effect and things like that. So a lot of it you can think of what are we talking about in terms of the relationship on these different axes. The military, between the military and the state, between the armed forces and its society, between the society and the state, and you know all this back and forth. But um, several years ago, I wasn't really satisfied with that as the end all. Um, <clears throat> OK, so when, you, so when you talk about this, this, this triangle, to elaborate on it a little bit more, you can you know, get a little bit more depth in some of these relationships. Uh, and then we're going to get into things like the, military of the, role, the military's role in policy. Um, and specifically, then you can start to break down the state. What do we mean? Because the state's a pretty general term. Are we talking about the executive? Are we talking about the legislature? Um, what about that relationship with society? Um, society is not just one big glob. You know, what about society are we talking about? Uh, the people in general? Are we talking about particular interest groups? Are we talking about the media? You know, what are we talking about? Um, but separate from this, this triangular depiction, developed this over the last couple of years to kind of point out different kinds of relationships and how it might play out. So say on the right, perhaps you have a configuration or a pattern of civil military relations where the military and the state are pretty tight and the society is maybe more distant from any of those. Can you think of any maybe modern day example of that? Any country that, that you might say that might describe their civil military relations? So some, some military, some, some state where the military is pretty influential. So I don't know, maybe in Pakistan, maybe in Egypt, you know, you know maybe, maybe something like that. Um, and you can play around with, with sort of the size of things and, you know, is the, uh, maybe you can have, uh, you know, the, the, the point is there's just different ways that this can play out. Uh, we're not going to talk that much about armed forces and society today, although it's an important thing. If you want to talk about it in Q&A, we can get to it. But just having put this out here, how would you describe how it might look in the United States today? What is that relationship um, in terms of you know, how close these entities are and however you want to define that closeness? If it's uh, awareness, if it's um, uh, how separate the society might be from its military. So would you? I would say it might actually be a little bit like the left there. Say, since the all-volunteer force, we've become you know, a little bit more of an isolated entity. It's become a little bit more separate. You've heard all of the, you know, the, the, the half of the 1% or whatever it is. Inevitably, that's affecting the relationship. So that's just you know, a way to throw it out uh, to consider some of these things. So when we get in the policy context, we're very concerned about how these spheres overlap. So it's something we call in the literature, what's the civil-military nexus? So how do they interact and overlap? What's the degree of the overlap? What's the extent of the interaction? So I know in strategic leadership, you had this great lesson on the profession, and you read Huntington, and what did, what did how did he depict this relationship? Did his spheres overlap much? No. OK. And so that doesn't bode well for a lots of uh, collaboration. I think what, you, what, will, what we're teaching you here is, in fact, even I would, I would argue the, argue the mission of the Department of National Security and Strategy and the classes we teach is to get you some of that overlapping expertise that's on the civilian political side so that you can actually work at that nexus 
effectively. Okay, and in that nexus, in that overlapping area, is, is where we have what we call our national security professionals. So at the strategic level, they don't have necessarily have to be uniform. They can be, you know, the high speed civilian officials who also have that, that overlapping expertise. Um, so that's important in terms of how, how that plays out. If you want to bring in the Clausewitzian triangle, you can add another overlapping circle. And here, trying to capture, does it matter if society actually has any overlapping expertise? Do they actually need to know what's going on? Might that affect um, civil-military relations? Might that affect actually policy outcomes? Because if I move that, if it looks a little bit like that, my, my picture here, that would imply that the military, uh, that the society sphere maybe doesn't overlap very much. And maybe they're not so very engaged or involved or expert in what's going on. So I would argue good, quote unquote good, this is something that comes up in the literature a lot. What's good civil military relations? You know, kind of what's optimal, what's more or less optimal is that you want some sort of optimal level of overlapping collaborative space, which is implying that there's sufficient expertise so at least you can understand each other's fears and then potentially you know, work together as appropriate according to your role. So I'm gonna throw at you, uh, every administration, every country has its own pattern of civil military relations. So just for the purposes of uh, applying this to a particular case, I think you can't argue in the current administration there's a unique pattern, uh, especially if you consider the first wave of appointments. Things have changed some since the first year, but in that first wave of appointments, when there weren't a lot of, didn't follow the pattern that you're gonna learn in some upcoming lessons, actually we've already talked about in some lessons in NSPS, where does the, the staffing tend to come from? Tends to come from people with previous government experience, um, perhaps they've served in other administrations, uh, but we had an administration where that wasn't necessarily the case. So we didn't, so positions weren't necessarily being filled by experts um, in national security on the civilian side in key positions. And so instead of having that sphere of, you know, a whole lifetime of political expertise interacting with that military expertise, we found that actually a lot of the political expertise, um, especially early on, was coming from the military which had picked it up in its education and with its experience uh, and a previous experience of, of, um, of, of working with uh, the, the political leaders and in, in its position. So anyway, I just throw that out. So we have two, like I said, two lenses. We can look at things through the institutional lens, which is mainly the focus of the lesson this week because that's kind of where the policy analysis will come in. And I just want to mention the sociological or cultural <coughs> lens is also important because it's focusing on the relationship with society. And this is played out in Huntington's um, imperatives, which you almost talked about in your strategic leadership lesson. Like if you're gonna talk about one more thing, you would, this would be the next thing that you would have talked about and that Huntington laid out very early in his book, uh, even on page two, he mentions it for the first time, that to understand civil military relations, you have to understand the key underlying tension in the relationship. And he says this comes from the fact that there are two competing imperatives. So if you have an imperative, like if something's imperative, does that mean it's the second most important thing for you to focus on today? What are your imperatives, right? You, you tend to have one at a time. So he's saying, no, there's, there's two imperatives, and that means one is not more important than the other, so they're gonna come into conflict sort of by design. So what are those two imperatives? So he says, on the one hand, there's the functional imperative when we're talking about civil military relations, and that's why do we even have a military in the first place? What must it do? 
okay, must protect the state. We talked about national interest this week. You know, it's going to be one of our instruments. Um, we help talk about our foreign enduring interests, security of the state, you know, way up there. So it must be competent in performing this vital function. The whole reason it was established in the first place, and as I get into my new research here, we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, where that comes from in our founding and how this was actually kind of a big deal um, to even create the standing army in the first place. You're very reluctant to do it. So that's the functional imperative. The societal imperative, they must perform this functional responsibility in ways consistent with the societal values, the national character, the ideological uh, ideology of the state. Now, depending on whatever kind of state and political system you have, your societal imperative might be different. In our case, it's a democracy, and so that's very fundamental. Uh, as we get into, we take an oath to the Constitution, which is to a type of process. There are certain ways that this must be carried out. Okay, so, so that's important. Okay, so that's just a little bit of kind of setting your plate for what's going to come later in the week. And I'm going to get a little, now I'm going to go back in time. We're going to take a little bit of a historical focus for a bit. Because if we are going to uphold democratic civil military relations, we need to understand where does it come from? Uh, what are the constitutional foundations of what we're supposed to be doing? So if we take an oath to support and defend the Constitution, what does that mean? What's that all based on? What are some inherent responsibilities? that come from that. So I went back, I looked into some of the Federalist Papers, and looked at some of those arguments that were going on at the time when <clears throat> the um, founders met in Philadelphia in 1787, decided they needed to do a redo. So I don't know how much you talked about this in your class earlier uh, on the, our lessons on values and interests, and you reread the Constitution, and this and that. But we did have a first constitution, okay, which ordered this, our civil military relations a particular way. And uh, from 1781 to when this was implemented in uh, 1789. And so what was not going well there? What was, well, how would you characterize our first cut at ordering our civil military relations? And I mean that how you distribute the power in your system and how that's going to work um, went, went a certain way. Because we're talking about abandoning a vain project. What was that vain project? Constitution 1.0, where was the responsibility for national defense? We were 13 former colonies. Okay, so we were running our national defense kind of like how we tried to win the war. We did win the war, but we go back and Washington wasn't really happy about how, how easy that was, you know, working with the committee all the time. There was no central figure. Uh, okay, so they're like, oh, this isn't working. There's insurrections happening. Uh, there's some real threats out there that, they're just, that these individual militias just aren't going to be up for, you know, whatever it is, the Native Americans. We've got, um, we've got great power still on the continent, you know, we're ready to gobble us up if we can't stay together. Uh, with, you know, Great Britain and France and Spain and everybody's still around. So, you know, they're coming to believe this was kind of, you know, not really practical. And so what are we going to do about it? So this is their first kind of fundamental um, challenge. Did I go over one? I'm missing, I'm missing the slide. Where is it? Okay, here we go. So here's their first challenge. So in the redo, we want a military strong enough to provide for our national security, but not so strong that it threatens the liberty that this republic's all about um, and establish to preserve. So how do we strike that balance? So they came up with basically the some solutions, but in the implementing the solutions, they're also afraid of some aspects of things. So because we know at first there was no strong executive, right? We just had a Congress. We didn't even have a judiciary. So they said, okay, we need that. And we're going to make him commander in chief. So that's an important uh, civil mill role. Um, at first, we didn't have any kind of standing army. 
they talk themselves into, okay, we're going to have a small standing army uh, we, because we have to have something. It'll be controlled because we're just going to give it a limited mission because we still have all these militias that are going to be the predominance of where our military um, power is. And so that's how we're going to control the small standing army because it's going to have a very limited mission. And if there's any trouble, we've got all these militias that will keep that in check. Oh, and we're going to have a ton of checks and balances in our new constitution. We're going to have not just uh, we're going to have not just one master. The old master was the Congress, and only the Congress. We're going to interject an executive, and he is going to be commander in chief. But like our two imperatives, we're going to have two masters, and one's not more important than the other. So Congress is going to be. Uh, just as important in civilian control over the military as the executive. One does not trump the other. So that's part of the design. Oh, and we're still worried. So all the money's got to come through Congress. And, and, and every two years, we're going to have to re-up this. So can't get too out of control. Oh, and by the way, every, every male out there is armed anyway, because that's they're, they're all part of their local militias every citizen a soldier. So we're really not worried about this little standing army, which kind of like, you know, we, uh, it's a necessary evil that we're going to have to put up with, but we're going to check it. So they had these solutions, but they were still afraid because they thought, oh, that standing army, that might lead to militarism. And that's like the last thing they wanted. Because remember, that was one of the big things that they were revolting about in the first place. Um, that the, the oppression of the, the quartering of the soldiers and the, uh, the British troops and all that. They were worried. They didn't want what they called the soldiery to get too popular. Because they, they, uh, they thought that out and said, you know, it's, it's, just a, it's just a step. It's one thing to be popular, and then the next thing, they will be running, you know, running things. So they were little still worried about the civilian control not holding. And it's still going to be a challenge to balance uh, this liberty um, and security. But the first step is to rewrite that constitution, reorder the power, and by doing so, you're reordering your civil military relations. But, let me do this one. Um, and again, we've got some um, built in checks. So Hamilton thought, you know, I'm not so worried. This is the every citizen a soldier point, right? So he said, it's going to be small. Um, don't worry, because it'll never overmatch the citizenry. Um, but we want to make sure the citizens not habituated to look up to the military power for perfection or to submit to its oppressions, neither love nor fear the soldiery. So they don't want this military institution being put up on a, a pedestal, uh, you know, one way or the other. It's just this sort of necessary evil in the middle to have security, uh, but they were afraid of it, you know, going too, too far in, in any direction. Okay, but constitutions, it turns out, and I'm sure you can see this if you do any comparative politics study in, in, the, in the history of the world, Often they're not enough. You know, you can have it all worked out on paper. That sets out the rules of the game. But that not, cannot guarantee your democracy. So what do we need on top of that? So this is from a new book. You've probably heard of it, How Democracies Die. It's actually a very thin volume. Came out, I think, just this year. A lot of, a lot of kind of play out there and reviews. But the, the theme, the thesis of the book these authors, uh, political scientists, they went back and they studied how democracies you know, went by the wayside throughout history. And their conclusion was it wasn't so much ex external threats, it was that they came, they died from within with their, their own democratic institutions eroding and the cumulative effect of that over time. Um, so with that as background, this is their, their thoughts on why constitutions aren't enough. Uh, for one thing, they're always incomplete. You don't think of everything. There'll be gaps. There'll be ambiguities. 
um, there's, there's no complete operating manual, things like that. <clears throat> so what do you need besides constitutions? You need norms. You need, you know, specifically, if you want to maintain your democracy, you need to uh, develop, maintain, socialize your people into democratic norms. So I like their definition of norms. Um, pretty straightforward. Shared codes of conduct that become common knowledge within a particular community or society, accepted, respected, and enforced by its members. That's actually a pretty tall order that these norms are well known, they're shared, they're accepted, they're enforced. So this is the definition of a norm kind of at any level of analysis. You know, so this week we talked about the liberal international order. Did you see this playing out at all? We've been talking about this week, is the order eroding? Is this world order eroding? What was some of the kind of glue in that world order? The norms. And we have certain actors that you know, put their energy into maintaining the, the norms. What happens when that system transitions, when it changes, and that's no longer happening? So this can happen at an international level. This can happen at a domestic level. Okay, and that's where I'm focusing you. Now, now their book didn't say anything about the military institution, which I think is actually a gap. You know, but I still went to it and said, I want to know what you have to say about norms. And because I think the military institution is a key institution for the preservation of democracy. Because again, the how is the military institution different from any other institution in your state? What's unique about it in terms of a threat <laughs> to, to the state? Just think about it. I mean, on paper, what's the difference between, say, Department of Defense and the Department of Education? Are we worried about our education civilian relationships? Or, you know, what, what are we worried about, at least theoretically? And it certainly plays out in other countries, it's a problem when their democratic institutions erode, right? So it's the only institution that can threaten the existence of your system as you know it, right? So, if a so when we have coups, militaries come to power not through democratic means, that's basically the definition of a coup. So that, that very act undermines, uh, undermines the institutions. Uh, so I'm not saying we're worried about coups, but there's other uh, things to worry about to adhere to, to democratic norms to make, to make sure that our institutions um, <clears throat> stay robust and, and viable. So that's kind of where, uh, where the rest of this is going. And so, the more I thought about it, and we'll go through some examples of how our civil military norms may be eroding over time, I, it, goes, it goes back to this definition that when it comes to civil military relations, our biggest challenge is that there's not a shared understanding by all those key actors, if you go back to the Clausewitzian Triangle, the political leadership, the military itself, society of what the norms are, either for the democracy in general or specifically for civil military relations norms. So that's then a problem for maintaining them. Um, so let's get into that. So I'm going to take you back to your professional les lesson uh, from SL. We're going to build on that. Because it just, so it turns out that understanding the profession, understanding professionalism in this context is a very important piece of maintaining the norms, okay? So <clears throat> let's bring this back to the civil mill literature where military professionalism comes in. Is it a double-edged or two-edged sword? So if we go back to our original definition of civil military relations, you look at the power and influence 
of the military institution compared to other institutions in that society. So if you have a situation where the military is more influential, uh, especially politically, than other, other institutions that could potentially have countervailing power to it, uh, then you could argue that its professionalism actually uh, could lead to you know, taking over as far as that goes. So the only reason that, so the select to the kind of the state of nature kind of thing we talk about, if it was just based on where that power is and where that potential power is, um, this guy Samuel Feiner, who was a great comparativist writing about this in the 60s, a contemporary of Huntington, he would argue, um, counter to Huntington, Feiner's argument was, someone explain to me why militaries aren't running all these countries you know, where, where the math comes out that way. Because that's kind of like the state of nature. And then, of course, his solution is the only reason that's not happening is because of the influence of norms. Because if you remember your study of uh, Huntington and professionalism, what did he say? How did he, what was even the very definition of professionalism? Is that you're professional military if, it's kind of that civil military bargain, the, the civilians are going to leave the military kind of to their own devices. They get this autonomy. They get this professional autonomy. What's the trade-off to accept civilian control? But that's a norm. That's accepting a norm, right? That's not based on you know, an underlying material power thing or anything like that. Um, so that makes it actually kind of complicated. So the, so the armed forces, in order to uphold their obligations to the Constitution, they must understand that this is actually rooted also in professional norms. And they must have a firm grasp of that. And it's related then also to the functional and societal imperatives. Because the societal imperative would say, yes, go about, do your job, do what you're supposed to do, but consistent with societal's values. And we would extend that to say the constitutional norms. So that's job one. Um, we have to explain this to the appropriate actors so they can play their roles. So again, so that's kind of like the military's role in this. So the biggest piece the military can do is to understand its own professional norms, which probably will also involve educating other actors whose job is to enforce them and to not undermine them. Okay. So you've got a situation where you have political leaders who probably have no idea about your profession and about this kind of thing. And who knows, they might be tempted for short-term political gain to do get you involved in something that would undermine your norm. And so you then you would have to kind of you know, step back and you know, preserve uh, your profession and hopefully explain this to various actors and society as a whole. So I, think, you know, so I think there's a weakness in the military itself, but there's also a weakness in these other actors. And, and if, so we, need, we need to shore that up. Okay, so then we move on to the civilians. So this is, I think, Feiner's, one of his greatest contributions, one of the greatest uh, paragraphs in his book, The Man on Horseback. Great title, trying to explain why these things happen and the man on horseback ends up becoming uh, the power in various places. So where public attachment, to civilian institutions is strong, military intervention in politics will be weak. But when public attachment to civilian institutions is weak or non-existent, military intervention in politics will find wide scope, both in manner and in substance. So what I like about this is he's explaining what happens in societies where, first of all, in this definition, the military's got a certain number, it's, it, it's got a level of influence. The civilian institutions uh, are not checking it by virtue of not being attached to their own institution sufficiently that they would use to check, uh, to check the military 
um, authority. It also highlights, if you go back and if you unpack any coup, you're not going to see that the military just did this out of the blue. Almost always, it'll be at the invitation of civilians. So at the invitation of key civilians to say, oh, those people we elected, they are so incompetent. They're so cr You guys come in. You come in. We invite you. We, we don't want to wait for that election or anything. We invite you to come in, not within the normal political process. So there's always some complicity, uh, which I think we don't, is not fully appreciated. So that lead, led me to ask the question, if you apply this kind of thinking, you know, theoretically, to a current time and place, and there's you know, talk of erosion of democracy writ large, globally, um, within our country and other countries, to, to some extent, are we becoming less attached to our democratic institutions? And, and part of it may just be ignorance and not, uh, not being fully aware of our, of our constitutional or origins and uh, what should be happening as far as that goes. So then there's, you know, and I'm sure you've all seen polls like this, but this is some of the latest data from 2018, Gallup poll. And the question is, you know, considering various institutions, you know, do you have a great deal or a lot of respect for fill in the blank institutions? Now, this is what a comprehensive list. There you can go to the source and you'll find there's a lot more things they asked about. But I did pick out the three, you know, the, the, that essence of the constitutional order that our founders created the presidency, the Congress, the court, and not scoring so high. Of course, Congress is getting the lowest number at 11%, but coming in at 30, tie for 37% is not that great. And look at that military. Like, four standardies above anything else at 74%. So, and that's kind of ironic. You go back to that quote, way back to the Federalist Papers, you know, we don't want the soldiery, you know, to be too popular. It's all about we're supposed to love these institutions that they created for us. So it's a little bit ironic that the institution our founders feared the most is now the most res is more respected now than the heart of the system they established. Our three main branches and also the press as a, you know, our first amendment as a fundamental piece of the whole democracy equation. Um, so that's a little bit of a analyzing our environment. So then I focus on two norms that I think are very related. This one is very related to our lesson on Friday. That, you know, Huntington talks about an apolitical military. So I've always struggled with that. Because it's like, you know, because the way he talks about apolitical is like no involvement at all, which we know probably never really was true. I mean, there's always some type of expert role or, or something like that. And so with this latest uh, paper I was working on, I, I kind of settled on this definition of what, uh, what I'm going to, how I'm going to use apolitical. And uh, look at the italicized section. I'm going to argue that apolitical militaries they don't have policy preferences apart from the political leadership against which they apply their institutional influence, so I mean the military's institutional influence and power to achieve the military's preferred ends. I know this is a big, long sentence, but what am I getting at? What's the main norm that this is getting at? the main sort of democratic norm of civil military relations. Who decides? Civilian supremacy. OK, so now what can they do? There's the second bullet. They may advise. So going back to that overlap, that civil military nexus, they may advise the civilian political leadership um, and doing so, drawing upon their expert knowledge. 
So in fact, when you did this lesson in SL on the profession, remember there were three characteristics of the profession. What was number one? Expertise, responsibility, and corporateness. So I'm, I'm, I'm relating this not only, and, and, and again, why do you even have the status of profession? It was, this was Huntington's big argument. He's making the case because before he wrote his book, it wasn't 100% uh, accepted that the military should be regarded as a profession like law and medicine. So what was his case? How do you get to be a profession? What do you have going for you? What's that top characteristic? Expert knowledge. What about that expert knowledge? Does society need it? Society absolutely has to have it, and you uniquely hold it. So that then I'm apply to this advising role. If that's the case, then do you think you actually have a responsibility to apply your expert knowledge in an advisory role? Yeah, if you follow the logic, if you sit home with all your expert knowledge and you've got those political leaders, you know, hashing something through, and they're trying to make their decision with not your chunk of that sphere, right, <laughs> at that nexus. So, so, so keep that in mind. So uh, hiding your hole is not an option. Overstepping your bounds, because military institutions and military leaders can't have political capital to spend. There are ways to inappropriately do that that undermine the political leader's role. There's an article you're going to read for Friday by a former commandant, uh, Major General Bill Rapp. That's his whole argument, this idea about, because if you overstep that first bullet, you are then um, infringing or overshaping the decision-making environment, or space is what he calls it, of that leader who it is the role and constitutional responsibility to make that call. So that's why I have the follow-on point. So yes, you know, be aware of overstepping bounds. The advising actually has to happen because it's a professional responsibility. But at the end of the day, that decision-making has got to be, it's the, it's the civilian responsibility. That's your unique domain. Um, ideally, good civil military relations would be when the political leadership draws upon its own expertise and considers the military's expertise. So the sum total of civil military expertise is brought to bear on decisions as relevant. Uh, but again, that decision remains, remains with civil, civilian and political leadership. What's also implied here, if, if there's an area of expert knowledge, expert knowledge is actually a pretty narrow area. It doesn't mean you get to weigh in on like anything, okay, <laughs> because there's a preference, but is it necessarily related to your military expert knowledge? So that's where um, militaries can tend to start to get overly influential, that they sort of branch out and extend their reach because they can, not because it's tied to their expert, um, that narrowly defined expert knowledge. Okay. So that's what's going on. So we kind of lay out what the norm is. So what about upholding the norm? So it goes back to that previous definition of the norms. You can't uphold a norm if you don't have a shared understanding of it. So that's always going to be the fundamentals. Do we understand what the norm is? And these are some things you're just talking about. So therefore, so I have a slide for what, what the military actor should understand and what the, political, and the civilian actor should understand. So this is what we were just talking about. So the expertise is actually limited to the professional military realm. Um, your professional responsibility to provide it. Um, broader political considerations. Again, we're, we teach you to be aware of them. The difference here, this is, this is a nuanced area, I would argue, that it's, well, often what, we, what comes up in the literature is this idea of privileged voice. Under what circumstance does the military perhaps have a privileged voice in this policy-making environment if it's related back to military expertise that you uniquely hold? The military can make a case that that voice is privileged from the standpoint of supplying some expert knowledge that is not otherwise available. 
So I've drawn a line between that. So political considerations, yes, we teach you to take them into consideration. It's just when it comes down to making decisions, you don't have a privileged voice in that area. You know, where they're going to like weigh your input over someone else's input. Um, that doesn't, that's not to say we ignore it. We absolutely teach you to consider the, the context of things. Um, and so that's kind of summed up in that, that bottom bullet. Um, don't expect a privileged voice in political matters where the relevant expertise is lacking. And not only is that expertise lacking, but the constitutional authority is not there. And the more you weigh in um, inappropriately with um, privileged voices in places where pro probably shouldn't have a privileged voice, then that political capital is shaping and perhaps constraining that decision-making space of the constitutionally you know, authorized actor that's supposed to be making those things. So, so that's how that works. So what do we want the civilian political actor to understand? Because you know, we've had civilian actors you know, in our country, and I'm sure in other countries, who are happy saying, hey, you know, I'll see that to, I'm just waiting for the, the military to, to, to chime in with what they want to happen. OK, well, they're probably not the constitutionally you know, authorized authority. So, so never, you know, you cannot cede the policy decision to, to this important actor who's providing you expert knowledge, but it shouldn't go that far. Because they don't have that, that, that's not consistent with civilian control or our, you know, our constitutional norms. Uh, and, and the second point is similar. Only the civilian leadership has the um, responsibility to decide what's in the public's interest because we elect people to determine our interests, right? We were just talking about this the other day. And that final call on what's the national interest. So I think we learned earlier this week in our neutral line reading that it's primarily with the president. Um, and Congress can, of course, weigh in and you know, check things. But it's not the military actor's job to determine, or certainly to trump, any other political actor in terms of the national interest. I bring this up. It's more obvious when you study this comparatively and you look at countries where the military has come to power, and that's often what the logical path is, that they set themselves a place in society where they think that they uniquely can determine the national interest. Because they say, oh, we're above the fray. We, we uniquely, you guys are all fighting about this, so we're going to determine the national interest. And then maybe a couple steps later, they you know, install themselves to actually implement that interest. So it's kind of hard to see in a US example. But if you think of it in general, um, you probably see some examples of that. And again, only the civilians are accountable. And one, one of the things we'll talk about on Friday is um, we'll give you some stuff to read about when you offer military advice, what happens when you have a dissenting opinion? What's the appropriate way to you know, deal with that as, as a military actor? OK, any, any ideas on that? You think there is maybe some lines that are better to not be crossed and this and that? So you'll have a reading on Friday. Uh, keep this in mind when you get to the Cone reading. It's in your American Civil Military Relations book. It's called On Building Trust. So basically, what he's going to argue is when you're deciding sort of what to do, and I think you've already done some case studies where the um, military leadership did not agree. You know, if it was Ridgeway um, with a nuclear strategy and uh, things like that. So when it's so it's absolutely no problem to dissent within what we call within the bounds of the policymaking process, within the internal, you know, workings of the administration. Advocate all day long. You know, don't be a wallflower. That's your job. It's when you go beyond that, uh, not in private public advocacy. That tends to be a problem. And then going to this, this chapter you're going to read later in the week. Um, Cohen will argue, because once you cross that line, now you have breached the trust uh, with the civilian leader 
And that becomes a huge problem. And of course, if they get uncomfortable with that, you could be gone, okay? And now you're not very useful to them. So bottom line, if you're trying to decide what behavior to take, ask yourself, will this action that I'm contemplating undermining the trust I have with the political leadership that is you know, very important uh, to maintain, let alone all these other kind of constitutional arguments we've been making. That's kind of a practical um, argument as well. OK, so that's our, our uh, visit to the policy aspect of things. And we'll be, definitely be working on that later in the week. Here's something we won't be working on later in the week, so I just wanted to introduce, throw this up. Another aspect of apolitical, not just the policy realm, but there's also a partisan realm. So here's the second part of my apolitical definition, that apolitical militaries should, do not become politicized through partisan political processes. OK, now there's two, there's usually two actors in this kind of situation. Uh, the military actor may not run around, or the institution run around, seeking politicization. But the institution could be a target of politicization by other actors not so steeped in the norms and not so steeped in the professional norms who may you know, seek short-term political gain and perhaps at the cost of undermining your professional norm. Okay, So no one can stick up for your professional norm as much as you. And in fact, you may see along the way, you really have to educate you know, people you think would know. Or they just blatantly, you know, it's a, uh, you know, a Machiavellian technique that, yeah, we know it's not. In fact, I was at a, a the conference that I, that I attended at West Point in March where I did a presentation and eventually wrote this chapter, and now they're putting a book out on it. Uh, at lunch, I sat at a table with somebody um, who had been, he was a civilian, and he was active in um, political campaigns, uh, presidential campaigns. And we'd been talking about these norms in the, in the morning. And I said, hey, you know, did you know, like, when you're inviting retired generals and, you know, to sign your list and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, did you know you were under, undermining any kind of professional norm? And this particular person said, well, yeah, but we also knew it would help us. You know, so it's so, like, you know, don't really care. So who knows? They may or may not know, but there's these short-term gains that are always going to be tempting. Um, and you know, in our, this is particularly problematic in our current very polarized environment where Particular actors may get sucked in one way or the other. Um, just, just a week ago, about, if you remember, there was an example where President Trump was getting interviewed, and I can't keep track of everything, but there was some precipitating event where the interviewer was asking, so, Secretary Mattis, um, how much longer is he going to be around? Anybody remember this? And what did the president say? Was there any kind of politicization potentially going on there? He said, well, you know, I think he's kind of a Democrat, actually, which probably isn't good for your, your, your stock price if you're, if, you're, if you're checking that. That was not a good sign. But, and by the way, uh, retired general, Secretary Mattis, has been a really great example of upholding norms um, throughout the administration which is not an easy thing to do. So anybody track his response? The next day, Mattis makes a statement. Exactly. OK, so how about that? Poster, poster guy for upholding the norm. Didn't get sucked into it, but some response. You know, he did something to enforce it, to uphold the norm, and perhaps educating along the way. So I thought that was a really good um, recent example. So how do we uphold the norm? Um, this expectation of nonpartisanship. Now, this can open up a whole can of worms. Uh, I think there's definitely a line between personal preference and collective action. So that is then perceived as the institution is perceived to be 
uh, partisan in one way or the other. Um, that's not, that's not um, a good place to be. Um, so these are just some things to think about with this sort of partisan dimension of the apolitical that you know, we're not so strict like the George Marshalls and some of those. Um, even Mattis himself, who says he's not even registered for any party. It turns out most officers are registered for a particular party. Um, and most do vote. And there's nothing that says you can't. Um, but we should be concerned about collective impressions of the institution. And there's another whole literature, if you're interested, I've actually written a lot of stuff on um, retired officers and their expectations. Very quick Reader's Digest version of that, that um, the Army Doctrine Reference Publication 1, ADRP 1, on the profession in 2013 came out very directly and said, yes, retired military are squarely um, still in the profession, and we still expect them to uphold the norms of the profession. Of course, these are norms. They're not laws. Um, legally, they can do what they want, but if retired military is worried, if there's somebody who wants to pull the norms, there is actually some guidance. It's only Army guidance. There's no joint doctrine, and I'm not aware of any other service who has it, but there's something out there, and the Army is leading the way on that. And again, here's just a quote. Uh, actually, this was out of a, somebody's SRP some years ago who was studying this and uh, was one of my sources. Uh, this is a retired Marine Corps general. Those guys are always... Uh, Smart, and, and linking it to the prestige. So this institutional prestige is so high, but would it be so high if this nonpartisan perception as an institution were to erode um, significantly? Perhaps not. All right, so summarizing some of this, I gave you, a, gave you kind of some big picture how to think about civil military relations, you know, kind of a setup to take you forward for the rest of the week. But then we got into this discussion of norms and kind of your role in that. And bottom line, shared understanding. So education, education, <laughs> education, you know, wherever we can get it, from basic civics to, you know, expectations of the profession to all those who are responsible for upholding. Um, the profession and who have responsible for civilian oversight, they need to understand this too. And it's and this is a system of systems, right? So if democratic norms are going by the wayside globally and within particular places, it's going to have an effect on the civil military relations norms. Um, and so, you know, my big argument there is I think the military institution of all institutions is uniquely suited to kind of toe the line and at least not itself become part of the problem and get involved in this undermining of other institutions. Say as General Mattis, just one example. Um, and I'm sure he's got lots of other examples. We could do a case study on him. Um, and again, the constitutional process it's always important, more important than the results. Don't, don't short circuit the process to get the answer you want. So there is a literature, um, I think we talked about assigning it, but we didn't exactly. I think it came up in one of the readings about the agency theory um, where Peter Fever argues, you know, there's what the, the political leader wants to happen through his agents, say through the bureaucracy, but there's ways for actors in that bureaucracy to use whatever power they have to get their own way anyway, which he calls shirking. So there's like working, and there's shirking, um, and all that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, the important thing is how you come about making the decision, and who decides is more important. Who decides, meaning the appropriate constitutional authority, than getting your way with a decision from a non-appropriate you know, constitutional authority. Everybody, because remember, I'm talking about all actors here. Uh, the point of this little chapter I did was to give guidance not just to the military, but to political leadership, to society at large. Um, so avoid politicizing the military. Uh, 
And something I didn't talk about, but there's a whole very extensive literature on the civil military gap. And this is the backdrop and why I think a lot of these issues are getting worse uh, because of the separation between the military institution over time, who serves, how it's not demographically representative of the society, um, and that is affecting uh, the civil military relationship um, at every level. The political leadership doesn't necessarily have skin in the game. They themselves have, by and large, not served. Their children are not serving. Um, the vast majority of their constituents have not served. So there's not a lot of pressure uh, on our political leaders now to pay attention. I mean, there's um, implications for foreign policy, for use of force, for reauthorizing authorizations for the military use of force, which we haven't done since 9-11, you know, this and that. So there are some implications, and it does affect uh, all of this. It's just this big kind of piece of it. Uh, last thing I'll say about that, uh, trending toward, some are calling it the military caste. More and more children of military families are increasingly are the ones that are following their parents' footsteps, often because it's just an unknown option to other people. I mean, that's certainly that's my experience with uh, local college kids and you know this and that. It's just not on people's radar. It goes back to the gap. Okay. All right. So, any questions? Any follow up? There must be something. Think of something. Yeah, you got one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm definitely, all of this analysis is focusing very much on sort of professional obligations. And at a minimum, don't sacrifice the professional obligation, which goes all the way back to constitutional foundations for some type of bureaucratic behavior or justification or something like that. So if you have to choose, um, I hopefully I was trying to make the argument that, that upholding the norms of the profession is actually a critical piece of keeping our democracy upheld. I mean, it sounds a little counterintuitive, but the military properly playing its role in this and everybody treating it appropriately and not trying to drag it one way or the other, that civil military balance is the priority. Um, everything else, I think, is just a whole different order of um, importance, you know, especially in the long run. No, as far as that goes. All right, got a question here and then in the back. Ma'am, Phil Lamb, Seminar 14. Uh, reference the civil mill gap. What role do you think guys like H.R. McMaster, mm -hmm. uh, John Kelly, others play in kind of the professionalism, the appropriateness of it in a retired capacity? There's a lot of argument that the lack of congressional uh, retirees that we have right now is playing a role mm -hmm. in the civic mill gap. So what's your, your belief in the appropriateness of that? Uh, so by the way, I put, there's a ton of slides that are, that, I, that are on this presentation that will get to you. There's a whole big thing on the gap. But what's com what, what, what the arguments that come up with that related to what we've been talking about is that the trend to have retired generals serve in what have traditionally been civilian roles. You know, theoretically, um, some people have a problem with that because they're not bringing, because their sphere of expertise is not political. So that means those positions are not being filled by people who do have the political expertise. The other issue with that is 
You don't want to create a pattern, which has kind of already started a little bit with some, I think, some segment of our society, that now we're going to go to the military as our go-to institution, like to do anything, even though it's not really in their core functional area. This certainly happens in other countries. And, it's be and, and you can give some examples, I'm sure, how it's already happened, is happening here. Um, so far, it's been mainly with I mean, maybe there's other you know, security institutions or other organizations that could be doing things that, that we do. But to the extent that it, it spreads out into society you know, in general, now that's militarism. Okay, that, so, that's, so that's another issue. Now, with uh, McMaster, part of, uh, a lot of the uh, purists had a problem with the fact that he did not retire and was serving in a political position still in uniform, which just, as you know, this complicates a lot of things. So you have like more bosses, you know, and, and this and that. So some, you know, purists would have liked to have seen if that's going to happen, you know, take off the uniform. So that, that at least eliminates one aspect of, of um, that situation. But it's still a military, former military. And of course, in, in this case of Secretary Mattis, they had a they had a wave of law because this was actually you know an act of con. There's reasons why that they wanted what was it seven years you had to wait. That's kind of a long time, but it was thought through again because because as a society we're kind of paranoid about this, right? So we have it built in the Constitution. We had it built in uh, to the law there. You know, in this case, people seem to be okay with it given just everything else that's going on. So. But theoretically, those would be the issues with that. About in the back. Okay. I guess I would just uh, kind of take this to the very first quasi probation period before the military members can be held in some kind of special treatment. Somebody can go into public security prison and be put in some kind of military program. You have a couple of people often who get it all better. Yes. Get spouse support for mm -hmm. it. point where it's like when you bring out the 5,000 active duty nurses who did the Marine Corps federal border to stop the soldiers from coming out of the Marine Corps, who gets left with the nurse responsibility to border patrol and to take them to the military? And often those Marines come back from the same mm -hmm. population that's still there from the Marine Corps border. Where, where does this kind of thread through the board? Yes. Where does it kind of start to violate some of the Marine models and where do you draw the line of not accepting of military roles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to take you back to where we started, because remember our founders and Hamilton had that quote about, you know, I don't want that soldiery, you know, <laughs> getting too, getting too popular, because it's kind of think of it as kind of, uh, I know opportunity cost is the right word. I don't think zero sum games is the right word, but you know, if you're when, certainly when this happens in other countries, when the military keeps stepping up to do these jobs that aren't quite their area, it, it, it means that those who could be doing those jobs aren't stepping up to do them. So that instead of building the capacity where it's lacking, so you see this a lot just in your military operations, right? So instead of building the capacity where it's lacking, so that same logic across the board, you say, oh, they'll do it because they can do anything. All right, so then you're worried about, do you have the comprehensive, that's just a capacity thing. You'd also be worried about, you know, again, our founders don't, would, would be appalled to think that we evolved to a society where the military is considered better than the citizen and better than our revered institutions, which are our fundamental democratic institutions of our Congress, our presidency, our judiciary. So I think it's, it's, so that's not, you know, so if you bring it back to the beginning, which I think most people have no idea, right, that's the problem, right, because it sounds good in the short term. So I think we should focus on just reminding people of our own story, okay? <laughs> and are we comfortable with where this is going, and how different is it from where we started, and are, you know, is this still the way we want it to be, you know? 
All right. Good. Do you have any questions come down? Otherwise, great afternoon.